Yeah, so I was there in Monaco in June, and he said, look, we're, the, the riders are really looking to have an osteo at the tour. Would you be able to, you know, volunteer? And I was effectively a backpacker at that point. I said, yeah, I can, you know, travel around France for a month. And um, it was pretty unique circumstances because, you know, the, the hotels are obviously fully booked months in advance. And, you know, to add an extra staff member in at that point was quite complicated. So, you know, there were days where, you know, I would come in, do some treatments, maybe stay a night. And then, you know, they didn't have somewhere for me to stay for a couple of stages. So I'd, you know, get on a bus and meet them three or four days later and, <laughs> and come back in. And I was this kind of gypsy osteopath coming in and out of their, um, you know, Green Edges Tour de France. And Was um, it quite nice in a way? Because now you know how regimented the system is. You just got to pop in and out yeah. and then just be like away from the race for a few days. Yeah, it was really, it was really interesting at the time. And yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still referred to by a couple of staff members as a gypsy. Yeah. <laughs> well, good day, everyone. That, of course, was Andy Gerrans. Last week, we had him on the episode talking about the Road to the World Tour as a staff member. In his case, an osteopath. You're probably wondering, how could you actually get onto the World Tour as a staff member? Well, if you haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to it because he's got an amazing story as well. And that name, Gerens, yes, he is the brother of Simon Gerens. And this is who we have on this week's Talking Loft. Welcome to Life in the Peloton, everyone. I'm Mitch Stocker. And this episode, this series is brought to you by Rafa, our proud sponsor this year. They're making the podcast happen. And just yesterday, I hosted the RCC Winter Solstice Ride, the shortest day of the year up in the cold Macedon Ranges, up where I live. A real adventure, a tough ride, but a really great time. Once again, Rafa is not just about the clothing. They're about making people fall in love with cycling through these adventures, through these rides, through things like the pilgrimages, the prestige ride, and even just this one-off Winter Solstice Ride. That's what I'm loving about it. I'm getting to meet this different crew. We're doing different adventures, taking people out of their comfort zone, showing them new roads, all in the name of cycling. It's just really great. And I'm really loving that part of my involvement with Rafa. It's not just about working on the podcast. It's not just about wearing the clothes. It's all these extra curriculums. So it's certainly been fantastic finding out that other side of Rafa for me this year as well. Well, right about now, I've got the talking loop for you, so sit back and enjoy this. If you haven't heard Simon Gerrans' episode, I had him on the podcast in the second season back in 2017, the first episode of 2017, so go back in the archives, have a listen to that episode, but right now, I've got Talking Luft with Simon Gerrans, Andy Gerrans' brother. All right, I'm sitting down here with the brother of Andy, maybe a lesser lo- known name, Simon Guerin. Simon, welcome back to the pod, mate. This is now Talking Loft, but welcome back to Life in the Peloton. Well, mate, it's good to be back and it's been such a long time. It feels like a lifetime ago there was a Life in the Peloton. So a few years out of the sport now, but yeah, great to be back on the pod. You were in the very beginning. You helped to kick it up on its way, way back when we were in, uh, I think, 2017 in Geelong. But anyway, I'm going to go back and listen to that episode because we're not going to get into Simon's career today. We're going to talk Luft, which is more important, I think. Um, and let's just start. You've never been on here. The way it works this year is there's four topics. I should know that. There's four topics, style, bikes, culture, and about you with some questions underneath. You ready? Great. Let's do it. All right, let's just start with style. Most importantly, caps. Caskets, capolinos, how do you wear yours? What's your style? Forwards, backwards, brim up? Uh, I was always a a cap on the podium wherever possible, and it was always forwards, peak down. Nice. You might know this because you've spent some time on French teams. You've been around the culture before I was over there too, so you got to speak to those old pros. Why do we wear the cap with Luft under it? Why is there that air under it? Why has that style developed, do you know? No, I don't know why that style's developed because not every former pro or mm. early days pro would wear it in that way. Mm. Do you remember there was um, one of the Basque riders in Uscatel, he would wear a cap backwards but hard against his oh, head, yeah. cap uh, um, and peak flipped up behind. Yeah, so yeah. I guess there's a number of ways to, to wear the cap. But, you know, for me, when I think of a cycling cap, I think back to Miguel Indrain, to Neil Stevens, guys like that mm. driving on the front 
obviously no helmet, cap on, heaps of luft mm. and peak down at the front. Tell me then now, because you've already alluded to it, if you could have raced back in the day and I, I can't remember, did you race in, without a helmet? No, fortunately for me, the helmet rule came in just I think the year before I turned professional. So I just missed out on that. I think it came in 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 2004. Even in that year, I think there were certain stages or situations where you could take your helmet off. I think it was on a summit finish. You Mm. could throw your helmet or something like that. So it was a little bit messy. Um, But yeah, from then on, I think there were obviously a couple of very serious crashes and fatalities in the sport about that period of time. So they brought the helmets in. Well, then think back before that. If you could have raced in the time without a helmet, what would you have style have been? Would it have been like a leather helmet, one of the sausage helmets? Would it have just been a cap? Would you have just gone head, you know, with a headband? What style would you have had early 90s, late 80s? What would you have done? I think on certain stages, I probably just would have worn the cap. Yeah. And the rest of the time, I would have worn a helmet. Like, oh really? Oh yeah. Like you would have been one of those, just the, the the very minority, just with one of the old school helmets. Yeah, I think I probably would have been one of the old school helmets on like those hectic bunch sprints and stuff because <laughs> you know you've been a part of the peloton and and it was ruthless back in those yeah. days as well. There didn't seem like there was a, a rule book when it came to bunch sprinting. So yeah, I think yeah you'd want a helmet, but in the mountains or on a, a day that you were just cruising along, it would have been kind of nice to just roll along with a cap. Cap forward brim down. Yep. All right. Clear that up. Do you still shave your legs? Yeah, I do. Yeah, right. Why? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it's a habit thing. Maybe it's just vanity. I, I <laughs> yeah. don't know why I still shave my because legs. Because you can't use the excuse anymore. You know, for massage, you know, for crashes, I'm assuming you don't crash anymore. So it is a vanity thing, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is, <laughs> funnily enough. And, I, and, and it's painful it is to admit that. Um, yeah, it's, I get a massage once every few months. And I've got to be pretty sore to justify taking an hour and out, out to go and get a massage. But it's just, I guess it's a it's a habit thing. And I think majority of people who ride their bikes don't get a massage, really. Mm. But they all shake their legs. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing. I'm in that in that vortex now. It's like, well, do I need to shave my legs anymore? And I, I've done it probably like three or four times this year. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not on the old regime of whatever it was once, twice a week, probably. I think I used to shave my legs. Yeah, I don't shave them near as often as what I used to, that's for sure. Do you like to wear X-Pro kit or you like to wear New Wave stuff now? I don't wear my X-Pro kit and just being involved with the service course, we're doing our own kit. Mm. So obviously I'm trying to promote that as much as possible. The best way to promote that is actually get out there and wear it. So I'm conscious of, of that. Um, I have a whole... I've got, I'll show you afterwards. I've got shelves and shelves of old, old team kit, and I've tried to keep a, a team jersey from every team I rode for. Yeah. And then I've got a few of the special ones, um, uh, leaders' jerseys and that sort of things aside. But it's not something I ever wear. Do you think you'll ever get back into it one day? One, once or twice? Back into what? The old stuff. You know, you oh, just, yeah. just every so often go out in a hell ride, just pull the old, you know, AG2R kit on. Yeah, I think um, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, just to, just to rock a, a seriously retro you know, jersey, it's flaps in the breeze. It looks like it's about three sizes too big by today's standard. Exactly. I love that. All right, let's move on. Bikes, RMG, road bike, mountain bike, gravel bike, one bike. What would it be from now? From the bikes that I have at the moment, and I've got, you know, I've got a few nice bikes, but the bike, if I was to say, okay, I'm only going to keep one, it would probably be my gravel bike. Mm. I've got a steel gravel bike. Um, and man, that thing you can go anywhere on. You can mm. ride a single track mountain bike trail. You could ride down beach road if you wanted to. It can literally go anywhere. And I love the freedom to be able to just turn off the bitumen and ride down a gravel road on mm. the same bike mm. and not really think about it. The roll and resistance is, is fantastic. It rolls along really quick. So for me, my go-to bike, if I was just to take one, say if I was going away for a month and I could only take one bike with me, it would be my gravel bike. Nice, like it. Are you a social bunch or hour of power? If I'm just keen to do a bit of a workout, I'll often just jump on the train and just ride for 40 mm. minutes. Put a, put the news on or something like that. And if I feel like I need to just do some exercise, I'm limited on time. Um, that's what I do. But on the road, I'm all about the social rides. Mm. I'm not training for anything specifically, but I still love getting out of my bike. But it's the social element as much as the training element that I'm out there for these days. You're not getting on like the Thursday morning ride or something like that? No. No, morning rides I struggle with actually because I'm working sort of late at night. So it's a bit um, it's a bit hard to do those early starts. So my rides are generally sort of mid-morning. Yeah, okay. Pro hours still, I like it. Do you have a Strava account? I do. I don't do much with it though. 
So you're not going to... Next question is, do you hunt KOMs? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Do you have any KOMs? I don't think so. Yeah. No, my, <laughs> I, was... I only really started the Trava account when I was finished racing. Yeah. So yeah, it's not something I really got involved with when I was in the bunch. But the Strava account's great just to plan a ride and, mm. and to see, you know, for especially now with the commentary stuff too, it's really good to, to stalk other people's Strava's accounts mm. to see who's been riding where, see what the times are on certain climbs that they're racing over. I got pressured into it. Came back to Australia and kept people kept asking me, mate, you got to get a Strava account. You got to get a Strava account. I was like, oh, God. But yes, I'm agreeing with you. I really enjoy it. And I've I have hunted some comms. You know, that's. How many you cocked up? I've got a few. Yeah. I pick out the ones up near me. So, you know, make sure there's not too much competition around. And uh, I want to have this base around me where this is my hood. When you come into my area, you're just going to see my name. But that idea and the reality of that is actually quite hard. Yes. Yes. But it's really interesting to see how transparent so many of the current pros are. Mm. They have no reluctance whatsoever to post all their rides they're not secretive with their training mm. and they're chasing comms all the time it's just i guess it's a different element to keep training interesting too mm, it is good all right favorite training loop of all time that one loop that you just love and explain the loop because someone out there is going to know it what's that loop that you go you know what? i just i used to love training on that loop or oh, still do could be here in melbourne one of the go-to training loops that used to enjoy doing was when I was based in Monaco, which where I was living for the majority of my professional career. And we had this great little loop we called the Form Finder. Mm. And we'd roll out from, from Monaco and follow the coastline along direction towards Italy. And you kind of go through these rolling little hills uh, along the, the coast. You get to the first sort of major town in Italy, it's called Ventimiglia. Mm. And you turn left and you go up the valley. And you sort of head up the valley for maybe 10 or 15 kilometers and you get into some slightly longer climbs. And then you can go over sort of two or three longer climbs. There's a great coffee stop up there as well on the Italian side. What town is it in that coffee stop? Is it in Dolce Aqua? Did you go no, through there? No, it's the valley oh. before Dolce right. Aqua. Yeah, there's a good little one in Dolce Aqua, but that road's a little bit busy up that right, valley. Right, okay. Um, the locals don't like to give you too much space there. So the valley before that, the, bot the, the, the coffee shop that I most recently stopped at there when I was in, in Europe uh, a few weeks ago is at the base of a little town called Oliveta. Mm. And then you go over a couple of small climbs. And when you, you say of, small climbs, what, what are they? Well, the first one is sort of about three kilometers, okay. three and a half kilometers, a few little steep gradients in there. You descend down into a town called Sospel, and then you've got a whole bunch of options of how you climb out of Sospel. You can go over the Col de Torini, which is a 20 plus K climb. There's a shorter option, which is a five or six K climb. Um, you can go up the backside of Calder Browse, which is closer to 10K. So there's just, you're surrounded by great mountains. So was the form finder, which one of those climbs would you do? You do the, uh, they're sort of often you do the, up the backside of Calder Browse, which is about a 10K climb. But once you got over that, the scenery spectacular, mm. and you kind of drop back down again towards the coastline, back towards Nice, when then, then you flip left back around to Monaco. And how long was that? It's about a three and a half hour loop. Oh, right. Not that, not, not crazy long. No, not crazy long. No, not it was, but enough. it was. Yeah, it was hard. Well, as hard as you'd like to make it because mm. there's a few climbs in there that you can really punch over. There's, you know, there's a bailout option if you want to get home a bit quicker. Um, but there's a variety of climbs as well. You've got the shorter ones along the coast. Mm. The first one when you get up the valley is a little bit longer. And then you've got some longer stuff too. So there's a bit of variety. Who are some of the frequent guys that used to go with you on the form find? You go, okay, I've got to go with that guy. And when I know that I'm dropping that guy, I mean, good Nick. Well, it wasn't a climb. It wasn't a... Uh, a loop that we used to sort of push around too much. So I often used to go motor pacing around there oh, yeah. and chase the scooter sort of up the climbs. And that was a great way of building some sort of race intensity into it. Mm. But that's a loop that I used to do with like Mark Renshaw, Philip Gilbert was mm. often training with him around that kind of area. Early on, it was Stuart O'Grady and mm. you know, Matt Wilson, guys like that as well. So we had a pretty good training group in, in Monaco. Nice. I like it. A rider comes towards you. Are you a wave person? Yeah, hundred percent. What sort of wave are you? What's your gesture? Are you just a simple nod, hand off the bar, g'day mate? What's your style? Oh, just a hand off the bar, but it's often not too high off the bar. I'm not <laughs> reaching for the sun or anything like that, but it's definitely a hand off the bar, and and acknowledge the people coming the other way. And what's funny is is how rarely a wave gets acknowledged by someone the other way coming the other way these days. Down this area for sure. We're down near Beach Road. It's. Uh it's weird. You don't you don't get off a lot of waves, a lot of riders, but not often the return wave, is there? No, not often from the riders. Up in the country, you wave at the cars going the other way. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah, so everyone waves, and I think it's just a nice to 
funnily enough, kind of build a certain rapport with everyone that's out on the road mm. because you never know in how many weeks, days, years, time, they might see you having a problem on the roadside and be like, oh, there's the guy that waves to me all the time. I better make sure he's okay. Oh, that's a good so, tactic, yeah. And then it's just, you know, I think it's a country thing as well. Best bike of all time. That one bike you think, it doesn't mean it need to be the best bike in terms of technology or whatever, but just that one bike when you think about it, you go, oh, I just love that bike. I know it wasn't fast or whatever. Love that thing. Well, for me, I sort of revert back to when and what's my best bike of all time. It's the bike that had the most success on because that's one you felt the best on. Mm. That's one you have the greatest memories of, that sort of thing. And I think back to sort of the, the best years of my racing career was the early years at, at, uh, at Green Edge. Mm. And we had the Scott Foils. Mm. And they were an out-and-out out racing machine. They were not a bike that I'd like to ride on these days because mm. they were super rigid, but they were super fast. They were light. They were light. We had that, that bike really dialed for at that point in time in cycling. Mm. You look at it now and it looks vintage. Mm. Cables everywhere, that sort of thing. But for me, that was the best race bike yeah. I had. It was great. All right, next topic, culture. Favourite race? My favourite race was always the Amstel Gold Race. Okay. And it's a race that I just love the atmosphere around the race. The fact that it's sponsored by beer. Mm. You know, we just really, that's a great point to start with. And <laughs> so everyone who goes out there and, and watches the Amstel Gold Race is just having a great time. They're all on the beers, on the roadside. It's a race that, as you know, loops back on itself so many times. So you get a group of people on the roadside that see you come past three or four times. Mm. And there's not many races that you can do that. No. So that's really cool. Um, and there was always, for the majority of times I raced it as well, there was that finish up the Cowberg. Mm. And that was just awesome to race up the Cowberg, particularly going for the win the last time around. You notice the crowd when you're really going for it? You could draw energy off the crowd? Oh, you just hear the roar yeah. of the crowd. You sort of get goosebumps as you mm. come into the climb um, because there's obviously so much anticipation. They've been on the roadside for the best part of six hours plus. Mm. They're all blind drunk and they're just so enthusiastic about that race. So Amsoil Gold race was one that was my favorite race i never won it i went close mm. a number of times but um it was a race that i really look forward to every year mm, well that's that sounds like tour of fly i've done an answer once but i never got a, to experience it like that because i was sort of out the back and in the laughing group but um favorite rider of all time favorite rider of all time and i think well that's a that's a that's a great question probably not a not something i've given a huge amount of thought to but i think for me my favorite rider was the guys that I idolized when I was aspiring to turn professional. And I was a big fan of Paolo Bettini because mm. he's a rider that I thought, oh, my God, I've got similar characteristics to this yeah, guy. He's call. winning races that, you know, I would love to be able to win one day. Um, so I always idolized Paolo Bettini as three, a rider. Was he three times world champ? Two yeah. times? Three times? Three times, I think, yeah. yeah. Olympic champion as well, but he yeah. won, won so many races. And he was such an amazing, you know, performer at that classics you never focused on grand tours anything like that obviously target stages mm. but he was a real one day rider hilly one day rider mm. um so i always really idolized bettini our careers overlapped ever so slightly he did a couple of years racing when i first started to well, first time professional but he was sort of you know at the end by that point i think his last year racing might have been 2009 mm. 2008 sort of period he won the olympics did you have that feeling when you were racing with him, like a bit of star stardom? You know, like, oh, there he is. There's Paolo. Uh, not really. We probably didn't do that many of the same races at that point in time. But, um, yeah, he's a, he's a guy that I always idolise coming through. And, yeah, so, and that was really cool. He came out to the Tour Down Under mm. um, a f well, several years after he was done racing. And I got the opportunity to sort of meet him and hang out just a little bit there. Nice. Well, favourite rider right now? Favourite rider right now? There's just such an exciting crop of riders coming through at the moment. I think professional cycling has never been in a better space, really, with the mm. talent that's coming through. And it's hard not to get excited about what the cycle cross guys are doing mm. in the road scene or the guys that come from that background. So like a guy like Welt Van Aert, he's amazing to watch. Mm. He can just do anything. I love the way they race so aggressively. Every time they pin a number on, they never seem to hold anything back. And so... I Van Aert, or are you going to go Van Aert, or are you going to go Van der Poel? No, probably Van Aert mm. I like more so because he's more calculated. Mm. He seems more calculated than, than Van der Poel. Van der Poel's really exciting to watch. But you see him attack on his own on a flat start to a mountain stage, <laughs> trying to ride off the front, thinking, okay, <laughs> well, 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 what's the purpose in this? You know, <laughs> you're not going to win from this scenario. So I, I like the way that Van Aert seems to be more focused on winning than Van der Poel. Okay, nice. 
Favorite team and kit. Now, this could be a combination. You could go, look, for me, it's Mappe. I love Mappe kit. I love their roster. I love the, the riders in it. But you could just be like, you know what? I used to love US Postal kit. Didn't love the team. Vice versa. What's your favorite team in terms of kit and roster? They could be two separate teams. Favorite kit's an easy one. That was Fassa Bortolo. Yes, right. That's yeah. making a, a regular appearance on this pod. Yeah, love the Fassa Bortolo kit. Um, you know, I guess early 2000s when guys like Casa Grande and mm. Kelly Bartley were on the team, things like that. For me, that was that was a great kit bike combination. The Pinarellos in the white mm. and and blue, and then their kit as well. So that was that was really cool. As far as teams go, so it's not the combination. You just like the kit. You weren't like crazy about the roster as well. Well, they had some obviously big stars mm. in that team. Pataki was there too. Yeah, Pataki. He was probably a bit a little bit later to that team. Um, one of the later stars. Baldado, he was there. Yep, yeah. And then I worked with him yeah. at BMC, obviously, many, so maybe, many years later. So maybe it is that team, team and roster, or you got something else in the in the back pocket. Yeah, well, I, I, again, I probably wasn't as in tune to how they would race. Mm. Back then, I just liked the kit. Who like, was their GC guy? Well, I'm not sure if they had a, fan, uh, a standout GC. I remember Choni. Mm. I think he finished up there in the Giro. Right. Those guys might have finished podium in the Giro for Fassa Bortolo. That's not bad. Um, when you think back of it, Vicente Nibali turned pro with Fassa Bortolo. Did he? It's his first team before right. going to Liquid Gas um, in 2005, go. I think it was. <laughs> so he's been around for a long time. Yeah, right. Nibali. So, yeah, they had some pretty amazing guys go through that, that team, all the, the stars of Italian cycling. But as far as the way a team races, it's really hard to say now. <laughs> Thinking back over which way teams would, would race well together. That's yeah, all right. I that's fine. It, no, that's good. That's perfect. Yeah. No, that, that's one. All right. War story. This is one of those days. It will come to mind. Typically, most people have one from the Giro. The Giro generally produces great war stories, but it could be a classic. It could not be a race that we're expecting. Just one of those days where you go, that day, that day was just a hell of a day. This is why. What's that day? You just think, it's just a, Bitch of a day. Did you race the Welter? Did we race the Welter together in 2015? Potentially. Esteban was up there. Yeah. Caleb won the stage. It was his first Grand Tour stage. It was. Yes. When was Richmond Worlds? 2015? Yeah. Also yeah, that was that one. Yeah. 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 So I lined up in that Welter at Spania after a shocking year. I think I'd broken seven bones over mm. the course of the season. I was just having a, a really, really tough year off the back of a couple of great years. So really struggled to through that season and tried to just okay get things back on track by lining up at the welter with very limited preparation coming back from a shocking broken wrist in the tour de france and we had to work really hard just to get to the start line we had obviously a couple of great talents in the team upcoming talents with esteban and and caleb sort of lining up in his first uh grand tour so my idea there was just ride into the race get that sort of three weeks under the belt mm. try and help these young guys out be a bit of a road captain that sort of thing and then we had the stage, it was down south, it might have finished in Mercia. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, it would have been. And there was a mass pile up yeah. that I came down, it got caught up in, and I've come down and I've landed on my head. And I don't know why I'm laughing, but. And I was just off the back of a tough season, and I remember just being so emotionally broken from that crash because I'd worked so hard to be there and I've endured so many setbacks. I've come down my head, and it looked like I'd gone. I don't know how many rounds with a heavyweight boxer. I looked like someone had just kicked the shit out of me. Mm. Um, I had the biggest black eye, a big cut, and I remember just rolling around to the finish and rolling out the back. I think I was with another two or three guys that got caught in the crash and going up these climbs and seeing the look of spectators yeah. when they spotted me and being covered in blood. They were just like, oh, and you think, I haven't looked in a mirror yet, but I know it doesn't look good. <laughs> so... That was a day that I just thought, oh, what am I doing here? It's, it's funny to hear that because you actually turned it around and an amazing ride at the Worlds that year in Richmond. Yeah, well, I just pushed on at that welter and with the goal of the World Championships. Mm. I thought, you know, this year has been just such a write-off, but it was a World Champion, of course, that it suited me pretty well and managed to you know, sort of back it up with a top 10 finish in, in Richmond. Yeah, it was great. All right, about you, last topic, BWS, beer, wine or spirits? What's your poison of choice? Ooh, not so much spirits these days. And depends on the moment. If I'm just on my own, if I'm barbecuing or anything like that, or just after a quick drink, oh, let's grab a beer. 
Mm-hmm. And actually, the guys up at uh, Beechworth, they've hooked me up with, I've got a fridge full of beer from those guys. Oh. So I've got plenty of nice beers to choose nice. from. Nice. Um, but then at dinner, it's a bottle of wine. Yeah. And I'm drinking, you know, mostly Pinots or Burgundies this da- these days. So Getting um, the Burgundies out here. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've got a couple. Mm. I've got a couple of nice bottles. But um, yeah, with a meal, it's it's mostly wine. But if it's just a cold thirst quencher, it's always a beer. Nice. What coffee do you drink? Are you an espresso man or are you a filter guy? What's your coffee ritual for the day? You know, you start with a milk coffee after 12, no milk, espressos. What's your coffee routine? No, it's always the same coffee. I always oh. drink a coffee with milk, regardless of the time of day. Really? And my first coffee is generally within about five minutes of waking up in the morning. And my last one is generally at about 7 or 8 p.m. at night. Always milk. I thought you would have been an espresso in the afternoon or something. No. No, no, it's always milk. If I'm out at a nice restaurant, I'll often go with a like a long macchiato, so mm. something with not a huge amount of milk after a big meal. But at home, I'm always drinking coffee with milk. Um, the coffee beans I get are from the um, up in Mansfield. Mm. Get, get some sent down every, wow. every fortnight. They send me a, a a little shipment in the in the post. So from the Mansfield Coffee Roasters, nice, which is cool. Sort of support a local business from where I grew up, and you know I have the Rocket Espresso machine here at home, and yeah, punch out plenty of milk coffees. I've just had one. I can attest to it's very good coffee. So with milk too, it was nice. Favorite training, uh, cross training exercise. What's that one exercise you do that's not cycling? If you have one. Well, these days I'm not really training for too much, yeah. but um, I do a little bit of gym work every now and then. And I think it's just nice. I think as you get older, just to make sure your body's a bit more active. Yeah. One of the other sports I, I really enjoy doing and that I didn't get the opportunity to do too much of when I was racing is riding motorbikes. Mm. So I enjoy getting out on the motorbike mm. these days on the dirt bike. And you've got to be strong with the upper, upper body, body to yeah. do that as well. So I try and do a little bit of gym. All right. Most rewatchable race. That one race out there could be a stage, could be a one day race that you just go, you know what? I love this race. I love this stage. And anyone out there who hasn't seen it needs to go away and watch it. What is it? The 2006 Tour de France. Nice. And I think for me, that was my second, my second tour, my second year pro, my second Tour de France. And that was a race that just had so much going on. From before the race even started, there was big controversy with Operation Puerto oh, going yeah, down. yeah, of course. And then, you know, the race, it was just completely, like, out of control race. It was the first one without Armstrong there for a number yeah, of years. Yeah, right. So, so every, it was open. It was you know, completely it was open. There, like, Menchoff, uh, who else was there? Leipheimer. Yeah. Well, Floyd won it. Yeah. 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 So before the race, you know, Jan Ulrich was a big oh, favourite, yeah. but obviously didn't line up. Um, I was racing for AG2R Le Mondial, mm. and we had Monsebo, who was a big signing for the team, oh, and he was, was a big Monsebo favorite on the team. Yeah, yeah he was right. a big favorite for for AG2R as the as the big team leader. He didn't line up either oh, at the last course. minute. Christophe Moreau then was in. Yeah, so we had Christophe Moreau and Cyril Dessal was a recruit across from Phonak. Um, so it was yeah, yeah, that was the AG2R team. So it was you know an all star lineup and me yeah. at that time. Was um, it hard to get on the squad? I was always hard to get on a, the Tour de France yeah. team in a, in a French squad particularly. Yeah. So, um, and then there was massive, you know, controversy in the race with Oscar Pereiro mm. and Jens Voigt was there as well going on long, long, long range attack. So that was a Tour de France. It just, the rule book was out the window. Why specifically stage 11? Well, stage 11 for me was a really cool day. It was one of my fondest memories of the Tour de France mm. is because stage 10, Cyril Dessel, made the breakaway, he got up the road with a Spanish guy, I can't remember what his name was now. But anyway, Dessel mm. finished second in the stage behind this this guy, um, but he took the yellow jersey and he mm. took the climbers jersey. Mm. So he had both jerseys off the back of that. So for me, we were lining up and defending the yellow jersey mm. in, in the Tour de France, racing through the Pyrenees, big mountain stage. We had... You know, obviously a limited team already because we'd lost um, Montebo before the start, but DeSalle had really stepped up. Christophe Moreau was in the team. You know, he'd been the big star in French cycling for, for a huge number of years. Yeah. Um, so I was riding on the front of the peloton through the Pyrenees defending the, the yellow jersey in my second tour. Oh, that's – and because what I remember, I've just recently watched this as well, is – Team Mobile had a rock star squad there too, and they put it down on the Parasaur where you guys were riding right up until. Is this the time they sense Paul that AG2R? They've worked all day. The Portion, they say, is harder, and they've still got one climb to come. Time to move and put in an offensive 
Well, this is the hard climb. Look at that now. T-Mobile Armada on the front, all of the pink jerseys, and they're getting a lot of riders slammed straight out of the back. I, I sort of love this, and you don't see it as often now, is that teams committing, and this is no disrespect to, to sell, like we're committing to respect the jersey whole team right in the front with other squads and other teams that could potentially, exactly what Team Mobile did, straight over the top. To sell loses the jersey, but you guys were like, nah, we've, we're gonna back him to, to keep the jersey. Was that the, I guess, was that the theory then? Like, or was it just more respecting the jersey? Did well, you guys think he could keep it? Well, I think it would have been a bit of a stretch to keep it because he put such a big effort yeah. in the day before, and he wasn't a big favorite for, yeah. for the Tour de France. He did go on to finish in the top 10. Yeah. So it was an impressive yeah. ride. Um, but that day, it was all about honouring the jersey. Yeah. It was all about honouring um, Dessel's, you know, what he did the day before. And in fact, we're a French team with the yellow jersey. We we're always going to ride the <laughs> yeah. front. But majority of the work was done by myself and Sylvain Calzati. Oh, so right. the first climb of the day was the Tourmalet, I think. Oh, on yeah, that day. it was too. And we were literally rode the front. Tourmalet down the other side. There was another climb as we rode the front on. And then we hit the Parasaur before T-Mobile, which attacked the crap out of us and blew the race apart. But just by riding the front, we eliminated the front group down to pretty select number, yeah. actually. And a lot of good bike riders out the back. But I'll just never forget that day of riding the front um, and sort of keeping a break in check and, and defending the yellow jersey. Go back and watch it, everyone, because it is a really good stage to watch because it, it, it fires up from the Parasaur as well. And it's just you don't see this as often these days, just these amount of attacks and unpredictability. It's a great stage to watch. When you head out now, Gero, do you have headphones in when you go out riding? No, not on the road. No, because I'm, when I'm on the road, I'm generally out with a mate until about the social element catching up. When you do have headphones in, what are you listening to? Is it podcasts? Is it music? Um, when I have headphones in, and when I've sort of, this is probably a little bit more going back a few years when I was doing a lot of Ks on my own, is a podcast would be great mm. because it's just like having someone, you're riding with someone. It's just company, basically. Mm. And a podcast, you can listen with one ear so you can still have an ear out for the traffic that sort of thing. But yeah, I, I like that podcast because when I used to train with music, I'd find myself going too hard. Like as soon as the <laughs> music could get motivated. going, I'd get too motivated and look down, I'd be sitting at sort of E3 or close to threshold when I should have been out there cruising. <laughs> Last question, mate. What's the best thing about riding a bike? You've ridden a bike for so long. You're still riding a bike now. Why do you keep getting out on a bike? What is it for you? What does it do for you? I guess it's a little bit probably like an addiction in the fact that if I don't do it for a period of time, you start to get withdrawals and you really miss it and you feel like that need to, to get back out there. And my wife, Rana, she'll know if I'm getting a bit antsy or getting a bit grumpy. She's like, you just need to go out and go for a ride. Mm. She knows it's it's my fix and, and what I need to do for myself. But I think my reason for riding a bike has changed so much over my adult life. I started out as a teenager and I just loved the competition mm. until I got to a certain level and then it was my job. So it was my mm. profession. I was I was completely serious about it, um, and it was all about performance. These days, it's about going out and getting that fix, getting a bit of exercise, catching up with my friends because you know cycling's been such a big part of my life. It's the common denominator for so many of my friendships. Um, so it's a way of reconnecting with those mates as well. Mate, it's been awesome. Thank you for having me around at your house to chat, talk a bit of Luft. Cheers. Pleasure, Mitch. Well, there we have it, the infamous Simon Gerrans, a pretty familiar voice these days as he gets into the commentary, but it's always great to sit down with him, and I love sitting down with him in person here in Melbourne, something I don't get to do too often these days, record a podcast in person. That's the whole reason why I started podcasting. Love sitting down with him, love talking Luft. Guys, I have to say a massive thanks to everyone who got their hands on a talking Luft cap. There was a few left the last time I checked. They may have gone now. If you haven't have got, got one, get across and hopefully you can pick up the last few. But if you did get one, well done. You're going to look awesome because they're awesome, those caps. Of course, a massive thanks has to go out to Lara behind the scenes who is helping me make this podcast come to you guys. Will Jones, who's piecing these episodes together. But of course, our major sponsor, Rafa. Like I said at the start of the episode, I'm loving working with them, not just on the podcast, not just with the clothing, but also with all these extracurriculars that I'm doing, these rides, these events, these prestige rides. Like I said, it's a lot of fun, I can tell you. 
And guys, of course, you guys for listening. Hang in till next week. I've got a cracker episode for you. It's all about the breakaway. It's called The Breakaway Theory. Some really great guests on next week's episode. So guys, until then, cheers. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.